Good morning. Welcome. Um, so the first thing to say is I am not Gabrielle Benefield. So if you've never seen Gabrielle Benefield before, she doesn't look like this. <laughs> she, she, she has long blonde hair. She's a lot more attractive and has no facial hair. So that's just... Um, unfortunately, she can't be here. Um, so... I am, so, so the, the go-to organizer said, okay, so we need someone equally smart, engaging, charismatic, but they were all busy and I was in town, so here I am. And I'm going to talk about the exciting and dynamic world of governance on agile projects in an agile world, because I, it's, it's one of those things, I don't know, maybe as, as I've gotten, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a middle-aged grumpy white guy now, so I get to be a middle-aged grumpy white guy. Um, I spend a lot of time these days with fairly senior people in organizations. And one of the things that I see is this massive disconnect between the kind of people who run the money and the organization and the big stuff and us folks in agile projects. Who's working in a kind of agile delivery kind of way? Yeah, almost all the hands went up. Okay, so before I get started, a word from our sponsors. Did you remember to rate the previous session? Okay, if you didn't, now's a good time to get your phone out and ignore what I say for the next two minutes and then go, what's he talking about? Please rate these sessions. So let's start with what is governance. I've been noodling on this for literally years. And I have a problem with governance. I think it's not nearly as complicated as people say. And then when I look at the people who are saying that governance is complicated, they're also the people selling governance consulting and governance tooling. And I'm like, hey... Hang on a minute. I think governance is two questions. The first question is this. What are we spending our money on? Right, that's called investment. And the second question is this. How's it going? <laughs> what are we spending our money on? How's it going? If you know the answers to those two questions, you've got governance down, okay? The problem is, in most organizations, in any non-trivial setup, you've got no idea what the money is actually being spent on and no idea how things are really going. And so that's where things get interesting. So really, governance is about managing investment risk. That's what we care about, okay? So let's take a look at then, like, your regular delivery model. I'm coming into an organization. They're on an agile transformation. Agile. Who's on an agile transformation journey? Transformation journey. Journey. Yeah, everyone, right? Because it's cool, yeah? Uh, who's using safe? Oh, no, that's later on I'm talking about. That. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so how does delivery work then? What does it look like? Well, basically, time passes, okay? Time flies like an arrow. Fruit flies like a banana. So how does delivery usually work? Well, we start, we start with initiation. There's a program, project initiation. And we have definition and scope, and we have documents involved in that. We have typically a tendering or a procurement. Who's working in like huge, slow moving? Does this look familiar? Yeah? OK. So, and then budget approval. Someone needs to sign off the big sack of cash in order to do this. And then we go, right, we're away. That's our first gate. We got through our first gate. So now we do planning. And then planning is things like work breakdown, resourcing, scheduling. Henry Gantt that come up with quite a good idea for how you do that, the Gantt chart. And now we're underway, and we go, woohoo, execution. This is where the fun starts. Design, development, testing, all of that stuff, okay? And we build the thing we're building, and then we release it. So we have deployment, we have user acceptance, the transition to life, TTL, in ITIL terms. So, so this is how delivery usually works. And we have these gates, and at each of these gates, there's a bunch of fairly grown-up people uh, sitting around going, well, uh, do, yes, yes, we approve of this, or no, we don't approve. And that's kind of how it works. So how do we govern this? We govern this like this. Initiation, we have a bunch of stuff. We go to proposition review, right? What's the business case look like? If you're a government, uh, if you're a public sector or a, a, a large formal organization, you might have an invitation to tender, an ITT. You might put, go out to vendors and say, build us this thing. There's contracts, there's budget review, and there's payment schedules and figuring out how the money is going to work and how time's going to pass before we even start. I'm seeing a couple of familiar faces People I've worked with in the audience are going, yep, yep, that's us. Um, and then planning. Well, how does planning, how do we govern planning? Well, there's a project review board, right? There's a PMO sign off, there's financial controls. And then again, if you're in a, depending on the industry you're in, the vertical you're in, there's things like um, compliance and legal and regulatory and a whole bunch of other things that we need. 
and, there's a, and then we have a review schedule. We say, okay, the part of the planning is to figure out how we're going to review things going forward. And then we get underway and we execution. And then we've got steering groups. Ste who, I love steering groups. They're, they're my favorite waste of like three hours. Stage gate reviews. We have our stage gate reviews. And we go, well, okay, we're on stage gate. I, I've yet to find an organization that has fewer than seven stage gates from like idea to, to actually making money. And, and the, the, the number of things that don't make it through a gate is, well, vanishingly small. And then we have documentation, lots and lots and lots of documentation. One project I was involved in some years ago with ThoughtWorks, um, where I used to work, a wonderful uh, consulting software delivery company, uh, big pioneers of agile methods, and they went into a company where they'd had another software vendor, had been working with them for about over two years of a three-year program, and they had shelves and shelves of document. They, they had yet to cut a single line of code. Over two years in, no code. At which point, these people were getting a little bit nervous. And so they called ThoughtWorks and they said, we're getting a little bit nervous. And we're like, you should have been a little bit nervous about a year and a half ago. <laughs> but, but you know, now's a good time to be really nervous. And then we, anyway, we ended up working with them and it was great. Documentation, loads of documentation, loads of sign-offs, loads of handovers, right? All this is familiar. And then finally, release the CAB. Yay, the CAB, the Change Advisory Board. Release documentation. Do you have your, your release docs? Do you have your change log? And then we have a go-no-go -no -go decision. Then we have user sign-off. And finally, ugh, it goes live. Right? And that's what we do. And why? Why do we do it like this? And, and there's, I was actually having a conversation with lovely ben Benjamin Mitchell this morning at breakfast about kind of uh, where you start seeing perverse behaviors and, and, and weird, weird behaviors in people and in organizations. And this concept, Virginia, uh, Virginia Satir, the, the family therapist, had this, had this principle, she called it the principle of positive intent. She said, everyone's trying to help. Right? So all that stuff I was just describing there, someone thinks it's helping. So how is it helping? So, well, each stage case gives us assurance, all right? or the illusion of, but we believe it. We believe we get assurance. Because um, there's a lot at stake. I'm investing big gobs of money in this. I want to feel safe that we're doing the right thing. Remember, what am I spending my money on? Is it safe? Well, before I start handing my money over, right, then I want to know that things are okay. We make big investments. We do big projects and big programs and big investments. Uh, some people call them big bets, because big bets sounds more macho than big investments. But basically, we do that. And we plan and budget annually. Who works in an organization with annual budget cycles? Everyone, <laughs> right? Um, so uh, the lovely Bjarta Bogsnes, um, Norwegian CFO who, who uh, created the Beyond Budgeting movement, he says it's like having a bank that's open for two weeks every year, right? H how would that work? Because I said we have this budgeting thing. We plan and we budget on an annual basis, OK? Um, because we're often making multi-year commitments. Right? There is millions of dollars, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars at stake okay? um, in all of these big programs. And so, do you know what? <laughs> multi-year commitments are risky. There we go, obvious statement number one. Right? Multi-year commitments are risky. I do not need my computer to update Dropbox, thank you. That's fine, you can go away, Dropbox, thanks. I love software that thinks it knows more about your computer than you do. Um, Multi-year commi com commitments are risky. We fear things going wrong, so that's why we have all this stuff in place. What kinds of things go wrong? What kinds of things go wrong on multi-year projects? Everything, okay. <laughs> let's, let, let's set the bar there. <laughs> I'm gonna be a little bit more specific. Um, so the first thing that I see going wrong is cost overruns. Right, we budgeted X, and we're going to need oh, some more than X. Mary Poppendick tells a wonderful story. She's working for the US Department of Defense many years ago. And, uh, and they gave her this like, toxic, massively overrunning project to, uh, to, to try and deliver. And she's like, oh, thanks. And so she goes to the project board, and she says, I'm going to need like, you know, a couple of hundred thousand dollars to deliver this project, to, to finish this project. So they said, oh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Poppendick. You already, we're already well over budget, and we can't have a couple of hundred thousand dollars. She said, what's the value proposition of this project? And they said, well, when we deliver this project, we'll save you know, $100 million a year. She said, right, if you don't give me $200,000, it will fail. And they went, here's the check. <laughs> right. 
sometimes keeping an eye on what the goal was, what the, what the purpose was, rather than just deltas on the budget sheet. Well, you said X, and you want X times 1.01, .01, and that's not right. So we fear cost overruns. We fear schedule overruns. It's going to be late. Oh, no, it's going to be late. There are vanishingly small cases where it being late matters to anyone other than the marketing department. Right? Really. I don't care when 12.1.1 iOS appears on my phone, but I bet someone at Apple is crying over that date. Right? Because that's how dates work. Um, delivering the wrong thing, that's a big deal. Right? That's one of the reasons I'm slightly sad that I'm giving this talk, is that that means I'm not in the audience for Gabrielle's talk, which was exactly about this, delivering the wrong thing. We've gotten really good at delivering the thing right, or at least we've spent a huge amount of time obsessing about delivering the thing right. Delivering the right thing is the realm of product management, and I still think we're very, very poor at that. We're, we're, we're getting better at that. What else? Well, we deliver something, but it doesn't run. Operational instability. It's flaky, it's crashy, it's data corrupting, it's all kinds of bad things are happening. Okay, so there's lots of things that might go wrong. And then when we put out that invitation to tender and we got that vendor and they're delivering stuff or they're not delivering stuff and they keep saying, oh, two more weeks, two more weeks. Two more. I, I've been the developer saying two more weeks. I know what that's like. It's like. I've got no idea. Two weeks is exactly the amount of time that I can offer that means you'll go away. <laughs> if I say four more weeks, you're like, that's not good enough. And if I say it'll be ready by the end of the week, you can hold me to it. But a lot of stuff can happen in two weeks. So it'll be two weeks, and in two weeks' time, is it ready? Well, no, but, you know, it'll be two more weeks. You can get several months of runtime with just two more weeks. And so, so yeah, so st supplier instability then. We don't know whether they're reliable. We don't know whether they're even going to be there, right? And so what, what do we do? We think we can front load the risk. So we front load all the risk. And the way we front load all the risk is we just need to plan in enough detail. If we can plan in enough detail, everything will be fine. What could possibly go wrong? There's an assumption in that. The assumption is that this is knowable. This is planable. Okay? So some types of work are largely knowable. If I'm building a bridge or a hospital or a road or something, I know that the first thing I need to do is clear the site, then I need to dig some foundations, then I need to put in some support pillars, then I need to put in my what's called core infrastructure, so your lift shafts and all that. I can, tell you, I can talk you through all of the bits of building a hospital, and I've never built one. Okay? Um, at some point, I'm going to need bricklayers, I'm going to need plasterers, I'm going to need electricians, and I can tell you roughly when that happens. Henry Gant, very, very smart lad, worked with Henry Ford and Frederick Taylor building factories in the early 20th century. They knew how to build factories. They were very good at it. And that's what the Gantt chart does. It takes a situation that is knowable, breaks it into small pieces, schedules the small pieces, and starts letting you know when things are slipping. Brilliant for the class of problems that are knowable. Where you have unknowable problems, uh, systems thinking folks call it dynamic complexity. The Kenevin complexity people, they call it complex rather than complicated. Where you have emergent structure, emergent behavior, it's unknowable. Right? When surprises happen, it's not because you didn't do enough planning, it's because you couldn't possibly have known. So by weather, weather is a classic complex system. So weather is wind, water, temperature, pressure. Right? You can model the whole of weather with those four parameters, and a bit of geography, but basically that. Yeah? You cannot predict, I cannot tell you whether it will be raining at 7.42 on Friday. Okay, I can't. And it's not because I'm not very clever, or we don't have powerful enough computers, I just can't. What I can tell you is roughly what the temperature range is going to be throughout November. Okay, I can tell you what the likely precipitation. So I can give you system kind of characteristics, but I can't give you detail. And so we're in this world of trying to build stuff, and we think that we just need to do more planning. So here's where the, um, the impedance mismatch happens. Governance models generally are designed top down. We start with a portfolio, and we do portfolio management. And portfolio management is we have a steering groups and executive committees and, and those kind of things, right? And then within a portfolio, you have a number of programs of work or initiatives. There's a PMO, Program Management Office, and they kind of do a lot of governance and reporting and metrics. And there's a program board for each of the individual programs has its own board of people who are trying to steer it. And then that, within the pro program, you have a bunch of different projects. And the projects have project managers, and the project managers have, and the projects have project sponsors, the person who's got the budget, and so on. 
we've got this cast of thousands doing this, to, attempting to find enough detail. And, and so this is, and it's got the PMP, the standard PMP project management model, right? Which is great, except the agile methods are bottom up. So agile methods, team scale. Seven plus or minus two people, TM. Right, so that's roughly how big of a team you want. You want interdisciplinary cross-functional teams, because Scrum said so. You'll work in small time boxes, because like run it like mini projects, because then you, how far, you know, Kent Beck famously said, uh, if I'm running a one-week project, how far can a one-week project slip in a week? About a week, <laughs> right? <That's laughs> We've probably got that. <laughs> I can probably tell within a week whether I'm slipping by a week, right? Um, release software frequently. This is all good stuff. Collaborate closely with the user. These are all you know, good agile principles. Plan in small time boxes based on feedback, right? So agile is all about this team scale on the ground stuff. Funding, usually incremental. Just keep on paying us and paying us and paying us and we'll keep delivering and delivering and, and if you don't like what you're seeing, turn the money off. That's okay, yeah? So agile is about teams delivering small slices and acting on feedback, right? Which is great, except Agile methods then look like this. Got a whole bunch of teams delivering a bunch of stuff, which is nice, okay? And somewhere I've got the boss. <laughs> you know, oh, how are my Agile teams doing? And then you say, so what happens in between these teams and the boss then? And Agile goes <whistles> and collect underpants? I don't know, something, right? So, so stuff happens in between. And uh, there's a chap, Richard Dernall, lovely, lovely chap, Richard Dernall, uh, many years ago now, about 10 years ago, um, wrote a blog post that has been lost. I can't even find it on the Wayback Machine, on the internet, on the archive.org. I'm sure it's out there somewhere. But he wrote this lovely article called Agile Adoption Patterns. The only thing wrong with it, it's not to do with agile or adoption or patterns, but apart from that, it's brilliant. Okay. <laughs> And he describes a six-stage kind of process, what he was finding again and again. Again, I worked with him at ThoughtWorks for some time. And he would go into organizations and help them on these kind of transformation-type journeys, usually at a fairly senior level. And he noticed a pattern of behavior in the organization, or a pattern of adoption. Um, and so what he used to do is he used to coach CIOs and C-suite with this pattern, with this model, so that they would know what was coming. He said, the first thing that happens is the people break. What does that mean? Well, that means that you come in with your crazy new ideas and all go, I'm not doing that. And, and then you kind of start to influence them and work with them and talk to them. And they go, oh, actually, yeah, maybe I'll give that a try. So that's the first thing, the people break. The second thing then is the tools break. So to by tools, I mean your project planning and tracking tools. All of the things that, that plan resources and resource leveling and, and, and increments and da, da 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 all that stuff stops working when you're working iteratively, when you're, when you're discovering as you go. Okay. Then the governance breaks, which is this bit, okay? So the way I govern a traditional project, my illusion of control, I have all my cost metrics and my time allocation. Who has timesheets? Who has timesheets? Keep your hands up if you fill them in honestly. Yeah, no one, no one, yeah. No, you didn't spend 14.5 weeks on that, uh, hours on that thing this week. No, you didn't, you're lying. Right? You spent two and a half hours on it. You were then alt tabbed around. Someone was wrong on Reddit, so you had to go and fix that. And then, and then, oh, you had to reply to that tweet because you cannot let that go loose. And then, oh, the build finished. And then you had to go and fix the build. Okay, it's really, really hard to track in detail what you're doing with your time. And it probably doesn't matter. Spoiler. <laughs> so once we get good at governance, then the customer breaks. And I don't mean your wonderful, omniscient, embedded, in-team uh, XP customer or your wonderful, equally wonderful, omniscient Scrum product owner. I mean, your 50-headed senior manager screaming lots of different agendas customer when you're building a big program. Okay, that breaks. And then finally, you know, you rein all that in, and then the money breaks. Right? How do we fund this stuff? Well, we want to fund it annually with our two, two weeks a year bank. Well, that's not really going to work, so we need to talk about that. And finally, if you can make it all the way through this, you get to the boss level, the organization breaks and you win, okay? And now you finally have the organization you wanted. The problem is you are here, right? Most organizations, most stages, however far they get with the air quotes transformation, they get stuck somewhere between the tools and the governance. And so they figure, well, that's where we are, so let's optimize for that. And so they tune the crap out of JIRA and they figure that's gonna probably fix things. And it probably isn't, right? 
I love this model. I think it's a really powerful model. Um, the problem is, the problem with this, the, this, the step between tools and governance, Agile doesn't have an opinion about large programs. There's a difference between Martin Fowler and some of the other Agile signatories, and I'll name Martin by name because I think it's okay. Um, during the mid-2000s, the mid-2010s or whatever, so we spent about 10 years getting good at team scale delivery, and, and then people started were saying, what about teams of teams? What about kind of program level delivery? And they said, oh, Martin, you are a guru of Agile. How do we do this? And he, I, I was there, he said, no idea. I said, but Martin, you are a guru of Agile. He said, yep. He said, yes, I am, and no idea. He said... Because um, that's not what we were doing. That's not what Agile methods are about. Agile methods are about delivery in the small. Actually, Agile methods are about delivery at all. Right? So during the 90s, you had these massive multi-year programs that would just fail. And then we go, oh, I can see why that failed. We need to do another multi-year program to stop it. Oh, wait a minute. Hang on. Uh, and you know, repeat, add budget. Right? So, so Agile methods emerged because people were in pain and saying, well, we must be able to ship something. What if we tried to ship something in just a few weeks? What would that be like? And that's what they emerged for. And they're very, very good at that. What they don't have an opinion about is what happens at scale. Delivery at scale is a substantively different problem. The way I describe it is this. 80 is not the same as 8 times 10. Right? Getting 8 people pointing in the same direction is a largely solved problem. Getting 80 people pointing in the same direction, very different. Getting 800 people pointing in the same direction, that's fun, right? But it's a different kind of problem, okay? And so multiple Agile teams can collaborate on the same program of work, but you need to do a bunch of stuff. And funny enough, that's what I'm talking about later today. But basically, you need strong technical direction. That's the first thing you need. We all need to know what good looks like from a technical perspective. Otherwise, we can't scale. We need strong product management, as I mentioned earlier. We, need, we all need to know what it is we're building, why we're building it, who we're building it for, all of that stuff. And we need really strong program management. We need to know that we're all on track. Okay? Uh, you put the word lean in there because I'm not saying not to have program management. That's irresponsible. I'm saying that the uh, reductionist, detail-based program management is, is incompatible with iterative emergent development. But that doesn't mean we can't manage that program. It means we need iterative emergent techniques in order to do that. OK. So what we really need is what are called governing principles. So Dave Snowden, Professor Dave Snowden, uh, annoyingly massive brain, he talks about complexity theory. And he's been talking recently about uh, governing, uh, governing constraints and enabling constraints. OK. So governing constraints are, are the rules of the road, if you like. Enabling constraints are constraints we introduce to encourage certain behaviors. All right. So governing principles uh, drive on the left, or drive on the right here. If I drive on the left, bad things are going to happen. Right? So it's the idea is that free, you then have freedom within a framework. If I don't give you any framework at all, you don't get autonomy. You get anarchy. You get randomness happening. Uh, Kent Beck, lovely tweet a couple of years ago, said, uh, he said, autonomy without accountability is just vacation. Right? And this is the problem. I'm actually talking to someone at the moment I'm going to be, looks like I'm going to be working with. And she's heading up a big engineering function. And she said, basically, what we've got, we've got all these teams, and we've grown from nothing, and we've got some really smart people, and we're all using agile methods. And the, there's, she said that her words are, it feels like there's an incredible amount of drag. Right? What, a, what a powerful phrase. There's an incredible amount of drag in delivery. Right? She's like, how do I surface this? How do I make it visible that we're doing that? So we want these governing, these governing principles in order to align ourselves. So remember, governance is about managing investment risk. Well, then, if I'm managing investment risk, I need to look at investment, and I need to look at what I'm getting for that investment. And so what's the metric that I use to see what I'm getting for my investment? That's like a question, so you can say stuff. What's the, what's the number? Like, oh, how much, I'll give you a clue. How much return do I think I'm getting for this investment? Well, what would you, what might you call that metric? A return on investment, yeah. So, so, but the thing is, ROI, it's a blunt instrument, okay? It's a blunt instrument because it's missing a really important piece of information. ROI doesn't tell you when. I invest all this money, and... 
uh, but I don't know when I'm going to get my return. Okay? Um, I also don't know how much is at risk, which is kind of worrying. <laughs> so I'm going to drop all this money for years and years and years. GDS, Government Digital Services, in the UK, which is the, the digital program in the UK government to drag it kicking and screaming into the 21st century. It only came to be because there was yet another disastrous, massive government IT failure. This one was in the health service, and it cost 18 billion pounds. Of I'm a UK taxpayer. Right? That's my actual money. <laughs> right? 18 billion pounds, and the net output of that entire program of work was nothing. Nothing. Right? Even the British government got embarrassed about that, right? which is nice. <laughs> Because then they finally got some digital smarts, which is long overdue. Okay, but this is the thing: there were no checks and balances to say, "Well, look, you know, we're we're, we're 16 billion in. When are we going to call it time?" Right? Well, let's give it another couple of billion, see what happens. Yeah. So I don't understand that. I don't understand why there wasn't an ROI, why why they weren't using something more sophisticated than ROI. So there's a chap called Chris Matt, wonderful, wonderful product manager, consultant in the UK, and he told me about this thing, risk-adjusted return on capital. Risk-adjusted return is how you price bonds, how you price financial instruments. So the idea with a bond, a government bond, you buy this government bond, and, and the government pays you a small amount of money on a regular basis. And so you price government bonds differently from long-term contracts because the idea is that money now is worth more than money later. So even if it's the same amount of money, if I'm going to get that money in December, I value that as higher as the same contract that's going to give me that money in June next year. Okay? Risk-adjusted return on capital is a much more useful number. It tells me when am I going to get that return, how is it going to work. Um, when you look at agile delivery models, they actually have worse risk-adjusted return. Why? Because you have transaction cost. So every time I do my little iterative releases and my little iterative ceremonies and all that, there's a cost to that that I don't get if I just fly blind for three years. Yeah? So, so, there's, so those transaction costs add up, and that means that I've got worse ROI. It's costing me more money to get an investment, initially at least. Right? But it has much, much better risk-adjusted return. Okay? I did say there would be math in this. Right? There's, well, there's going to be graphs at least. Um, so yeah, so this is our traditional delivery model. It's our del traditional um, graph. And what we're going to do is we're going to spend, let's see if this works. Yay! James Bond. Da -da 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 -da. We're going to spend a bunch of money, 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 money. Boo! There we go. And then we're going to carry on spending money. So what this looks like, this amount of money, this amount of sunk cost, is known as value at risk, VAR. If the whole thing fails right now, that's the amount of money I don't have anymore. OK? Oh, well, that sucks. The more the value at risk, the more I am subject to what's called the sunk cost fallacy, which is this. Well, we're already 16 billion in. How much worse could it get? <laughs> Two billion is how much worse it could get. Two billion. If anyone needs the answer to how much worse could it get after 16 billion, the answer is another 2 billion, and then you stop. Okay? So, so yeah, well, we have, whenever I hear we have an investment in, you have to use Oracle in this situation. It's not an Oracle problem. Yes, but we have an investment in Oracle. What does that mean? That means the more people I can inflict it on, right, the lower the cost per use, and the less of an idiot I look because we didn't have an oracle-shaped problem. Oh, I see. Right, and for oracle, substitute any other big product right, or big vendor. So this is my value at risk. The other thing that this represents is uncertainty. This is how much untested work I've done. I've done all this work, and I haven't tested any of it. So I've now got uncertainty, and I've got value at risk. Brilliant. Right? And then finally, ta-da, I do a release. Yay! And I really, really hope I was right. Okay? And then I do this release, and I start making money. But then, of course, I carry on with my you know, incremental funding of my project, and that's that line going down. So that's what traditional delivery looks like. Then we look at agile delivery. Same sort of lines again, same sort of shape. But now you notice that we've got much, much smaller value at risk. Okay? And the reason there's a much, much smaller value at risk is we do these frequent small releases. Bop, 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 bop. And because we're doing these frequent small releases and then spending money and doing a release and spending money and doing a release, there's like a win-win-win thing. The first thing is we've got much less value at risk. The second thing is we get feedback so we're able to steer based on what customers think. 
right? Or based on what our stakeholders think. They go, hey, do you know what? This is actually pretty cool. Or this is rubbish. Okay, well, luckily, we only went a short way down the rubbish path. Let's try going down a different path. And the cool thing is it becomes self-funding, right? This program is now paying for itself. Woohoo! Yeah, so actually, and it works like a startup. I actually only need seed funding. If we're building something that is genuinely valuable, I only need seed funding. I can either, and this works on, uh, so again, reasons for doing work, right? I'm going to make money, I'm going to save money, I'm going to protect money, right? It's going to act as a barrier to entry, barrier to competition. So if I'm saving money, and I've done this in organizations, we go and say, well, what if we did this piece of work? Well, it would save, you know, X million pounds a year or whatever. Well, well let's start. Let's start, but let's ship a tiny part of it. There's always a power curve with those kind of conversations, right? It'll save you know, $100 million a year. Right, but it's not just if we deliver this thing, bang, there's $100 million a year. That's made up of lots and lots and lots of bits of detail. Real example from a bank I was working in. Oh, sorry, all my examples of banks are really dull. Um, but one bank I was working in, they deal with um, quite a lot of trading. By quite a lot, I mean 11% of the world's equity trading goes through their systems. They have a trillions of dollars a day of flow trading. It's quite eye-watering. And so what happens at the end of the day's trading is what's called operations. And operations is matching all of the counterparties. You know, I, I sold you a thing and you bought the thing and that's we've got to figure out both sides of that and, and put it somewhere. And then there's netting. So if we've done 28 trades with each other, rather than 28 little payments, we figure out who owes who what, and I go, oh, I owe you that much, and then we're done, um, and so on. And so the idea is you take all these hundreds of millions of trades, and you net them all together, and you match them all up, and they add up to zero, and they never add up to zero. And that's operations is, oh, didn't add up to zero again. Yeah, we should go find out why. And so the operations part is really expensive because it's lots and lots and lots of these deals that, that we've got to try and figure out how to match. And we know that if we could make them always up to zero, we would save a lot of money. But it's not a single fix. We know that there are many, many classes of what are called breaks or fails, like the bits that don't match up. And we can categorize them. And we can say, well, let's see, what's the most common type of break? Or what's the most time-consuming or expensive-to-fix kind of break? Let's go after that. And that might only be a few weeks or a couple of months of work on this three-, five-year program. And so within a few weeks, we can then put that into production. And guess what? That class of problems goes away. That amount of work doesn't need to be done now. Woohoo! So we can start iteratively. There are surprisingly few, again, situations where it's all or nothing. If you're launching a spacecraft, okay, that's fairly binary. <laughs> it either goes up or it doesn't go up. Or worse, it goes up and stays up or it doesn't. Yeah? And so there's a whole bunch of things that you really do need to line up. Most of us aren't putting rockets into space, let's be honest. Most of us are doing yet another iteration on their internal reporting app. <laughs> right? That's kind of what, how we roll, right? Uh, someone was saying, I uh, did a lovely thing, when, when Elon Musk uh, landed a, a completely unmanned rocket onto a completely unmanned raft in the middle of the Pacific, they were saying, again, I'm trying to sodding debug React. Right? <laughs> but difference in kind of things that one doesn't want in one's life. But so this means that we need to rethink our underlying assumptions, okay? So the first thing we need to rethink is this. Flow of value, much more important than utilization of workers, okay? So are we getting results, right? Are we getting results more important than are people busy? We measure busyness. And there's a reason we measure busyness. Again, everyone's trying to help, right? Why do we measure busyness rather than results? Well, let's look at the history. Traditionally, it takes a very, the, 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 any impact your work has is distant in space and time from when that work happened. And a lot of organizations, that distance in space and time might be years, right? There's, it's really hard, almost impossible to correlate, we did this work with we had that impact. And so, because I don't have a value lever, the only lever I've got is cost, well, I just double down on the cost lever, don't I? Right, so I try and make everything cost less. Can you, can you make costing less? That'd be great. Or can we get rid of some of your team? Because that, that's, that's a cost in that. So instead, if we can say, look, we can, if we work in small enough chunks, we can correlate the work we're doing with the impact it's having. And so that means then we can decide how we're going to do that work. Let's measure the crap out of results. Let's measure the crap out of impact and flow of value. And then we can relax about things like utilization and busyness. Okay? 
Feedback. We need feedback to reduce uncertainty. Normally, we don't even think about feedback because we're convinced we know the answers because the problem's reducible. If it's irreducibly complex, we don't know the answers. News flash. If we don't know the answers, it's like getting in a car. You don't get in a car and just point it. <laughs> you get in a car and you're continually doing these tiny little adjustments, okay, as the traffic moves, as lights change. Every now and then, you might need to slam your foot on the brake because someone runs out in front of the car or something. Okay? But you're continually adapting to feedback. The macro story is I'm getting in my car and I'm driving into town. And I'm going to go to the lights, and I'm going to turn left, and I'm going to go to the other junction. And depending on how busy it is, I'll go right or I'll go straight across. I can tell you the, basically the plan. Yeah? But I can also tell you that I cannot tell you minute to minute what I'll be doing. Okay? I can't tell you where I'll be on the road because I don't know where everyone else is. Yeah? It's a complex adaptive system. So feedback is vital to reducing uncertainty. And that means that lead time, lead time is the only game in town. Lead time is your quality metric. It's your value metric. Lead time, I, describe, I define lead time as the time, the wall clock time between a commitment and thank you. Right? That's lead time. So, so uh, I, I'm, I'm going to do something for you. Here, here, I made you a thing. And what do you say? Thank you. So he's lovely. Yeah? I say, I made you a thing. And what do you say? And she says, it's the wrong thing. So <laughs> I'm really sorry. I need to go back and I need to fix it. And then I come back and I say, here, I made you a better thing. What do you think? Do you like it? Yeah. What do you say? Thank you. See? And, and that's the great thing with lead time. If you get lead time to thank you, incorporates things like rework and errors and all of that. Because all the time you're delivering buggy crap that doesn't solve the problem, no one said thank you yet. Right, so I don't care about time to production. I care about time to someone actually getting a benefit from the work we did. And sometimes that's infinity, because they never did. Okay? So lead time is the only game in town. Mm. Okay, so what can we do to manage lead time? Well, reduce batch size. Okay, that's the first thing we can do. Work in smaller chunks. Smaller chunks get done quicker than bigger chunks, and it's not linear. It's not even exponential. It's what's called an asymptote which means the bigger the chunk, the closer to infinity long it takes. Right? <laughs> That's a really long time. <laughs> okay? Small batches get done quickly. Okay? And funny enough, small batches have less variability in them, which is a nice bonus. Okay? So uh, there's a wonderful paper from oh, many years ago, 2004, I think. Uh, three project managers at ThoughtWorks, again, uh, wrote a wonderful paper. It's still out on the internet. It's called The Slacker's Guide to Project Tracking. Okay, And the Slacker's Guide to Project Tracking, what they did across a number of projects is they kept two sets of graphs, two sets of burn-up charts. One of story points, they'd estimate story points, and they'd measure all the story points, they'd do their two lines and their predictions of when and how much and whatever. And one of just stories, so how many cards have gone through. And what they concluded was that the graphs from just measuring stories and measuring story points were basically the same graph. So there was no additional benefit to measuring story points. Right? Ooh. Um, my favorite part is the conclusion. The conclusion is, on average, all stories are average size. <laughs> right. Right. And so that means if you keep them all reasonably small, the variance doesn't go crazy, and you can just call them all one. How big is this story? One. How big is this story? I, I, I'm, ready. I'm ready for you. Right? You need a lot fewer Fibonacci cards. <clears throat> so all, all stories are size one. What they also discovered, and then it got forgotten, and I tried to reintroduce it in behavior-driven development, what they also discovered by accident was this. If at the point you're describing the story, the feature, you also talk through the acceptance criteria for that feature, they tend to all be much more similar sizes. Ooh. And the way they would do this is this. They have these little five by three index cards. And on the front of the index card, you write, you know, uh, store customer details or whatever it was. And on the back, you'd write the acceptance criteria. OK, so uh, it needs to store address, uh, name. And then what about multiple addresses? Uh, we'll do that later. Multiple addresses is later. One address for now. OK, so that's the acceptance criteria. So now it bounds. And the great thing with a five by three index card is even if you've got small writing, you can't get that much on there. Yeah, the natural bounding. Okay, and so they had these five by three index cards, and that was how big a story was. And on the back, you'd write the acceptance criteria, and that meant that all stories were size one. Okay, so reduce batch size. Keep work within the team. 
Okay, anyone who's done anything with lean operations, this should be very familiar. Okay, any work that leaves the team ends up on someone else's backlog, and even if they're super committed and super keen on helping you, and it goes straight to number three on their backlog, I've only got two things ahead of it, and a week later you go, where's my thing? And they go, it's still at number three. Why is it still at number three? Well, things keep hopping over it, <laughs> but it's still number three. <laughs> But yeah, we've got a different one and two now. Is that great? Okay, how long has it been number three? Oh, it's been a while. And, and why? Because some other people much more shouty than me needed items one and two, right? And so this is the thing. You now you have no control over work that's outside of your, uh, outside of your world. So inspections and reviews, right? Code inspections, code reviews. If you're blocked on some ex inspection or review, bring that into the team. And then... We want to identify what we need to govern with. So I made up an acronym, VESA. So I stole parts of this, right? So the, one, so the E, one of the S's, and one of the A's comes from engineering, and I added some stuff. So what does it say? Visualize, right? Visualize your value stream mapping, event storming, whatever works for you to visualize, right? So visualize, make sure you can see what the work looks like. Then, whatever your work is, what are we just doing because we just do it? And what are we just doing? What can we get rid of? So eliminate what you don't need. Eliminate the vestigial stuff, the stuff that's there because we've always done it. Whatever's left, simplify that. Can we do those three things as one piece? Why do we have to do that and then that and then that again? Can we just combine those into a smaller, simpler thing? Once we've simplified, then we try and standardize. And finally, for extra credit, we can automate the standardized stuff. Okay? I see this as a kind of a virtue journey. Right? It doesn't matter how far along this you managed to get, you did good in the world. Right, we only got as far as eliminate. That's fine. Celebrate that. We got as far as simplify. Woohoo! We managed to standardize. Brilliant. We automated it. Way. Have a, have a bonus. Have a day off. Go on holiday. Go out for a nice meal. It doesn't matter how far you get along that line. You did good. And then what we want is a process becoming self-evidencing. Uh, what I'm hearing called continuous compliance, which is making me happy. Um, <clears throat> a quick example. Uh, 18F. So this was, again, right? you only get really good stuff after a really big disaster. Uh, so healthcare.gov, Obamacare, went live. Um, well, for values of live. Uh, it turned out it just collapsed catastrophically on day one. It could deal with like you know 12 concurrent users or something really embarrassing. And 300 million Americans wanted to sign up. So it didn't look good. So a bunch of jokers uh, called 18F approached uh, Obama and said, look, it's a website, right? <laughs> so he said, yes, yes, it's a website. Uh, I said, so we're pretty good at websites. Why don't we go fix this? And he went, that'd be great. <laughs> so they went and fixed it. And they started work. And they said, OK, well, so how do you fix a government website? And they said, oh, thud, boom. You'll need to read these documents. So this chart, there are, 200, there are 325. 325 sets of regulatory documents. Not regulations, documents full of regulations in order to build a government website. And they went, oh, that's how you can spend a billion dollars on it. <laughs> that lot. And so what they did, which I thought was rather brilliant, is they, <coughs> they split these regulations into dev and ops. And it turns out about a third of them are dev and two thirds of them are ops. In, terms, in other words, a third of them are to do with the stuff you're building and how you're building it and version control and stuff like that. And the other two thirds are to do with things like operational stability, data at rest, security, compliance, yada, yada. And they said, hmm, if we built a platform where all of that was just true, anything you put on it is already compliant. Um, yes, I guess it is. And so they built it and they called it cloud.gov. Um, and if you're a US public servant anywhere, you can just put stuff on it. Okay, and there's different bits of cloud.gov. So there's like you know more depending on whether you're doing stuff that's got national security implications or personal data implications or health data implications. There's different levels of compliance in there. But basically, once your stuff runs on cloud.gov, it's called FedRAMP now. Once your stuff runs on FedRAMP, uh, um, it, it's it's going to be fine. And so they managed to completely automate 269 of these uh, constraints into cloud.gov. Another 41 are basically templates. That's what shared means. So you, know, you, you spin up your project, and it basically copies a template of another project that has version control, has testing, has test automation, has a build pipeline, has all the da 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 da, -da. That's 41 of them, leaving you with 15, which is still quite a lot of work, but it's not 325. So now to start a new thing, the 15 are, are again, they're pretty straightforward. Do you have source control? Check. 
you know, stuff like that. And that means that now US government projects can start much more quickly and much more effectively and be much more confident that they're doing the right things than they ever used to. Thank you, 18F. That's very cool. And so and GDS in the UK has done something similar. And I'm working with an enormous German bank that's basically done a, a, a very similar thing. They now have, um, I, I can't remember exactly the percentage, but a, a significant proportion of all new work at this bank is being done on this platform. And they've introduced a new uh, rule, uh, a, new, a new release process for what they call small releases. And if your release is a small release, if it's within certain parameters, you can use this much more streamlined release process. So his vision, my buddy, his vision was idea to production safely in a day. That's to thank you, right? And he slammed that. He's, it's now idea to production in a half a day. So in a big, heavily regulated, slow-moving German bank, you can decide you want to make a change, have that change in production in front of actual users by lunchtime. Right? That's pretty cool. And so a lot of these projects are now going, yeah, well, that's only for small changes, and we've got this big project. We're going to game this. We're going to chop our big project into lots of small releases so we can use it. And he's going, okay, do that then. <laughs> Winning. <laughs> and, and this is the thing, is that once you have those enabling constraints, you don't have to use his platform. That's an enabling constraint. But if you do, if you slice your stuff into small pieces so you can, you can go home early. You don't have to do all that governance stuff because he already did it for you. So then, wrapping up, governance is about managing investment risk. That's it. What am I spending my money on? Is it safe? Okay. Iterative delivery methods reduce risk and surface uncertainty so we can see it, which is kind of cool. But your governance needs to change to benefit from this. If you have reductive, detail-focused governance, you cannot possibly benefit from iterative, emergent information. You already planned it. Okay. All software development carries uncertainty. Newsflash. Right? I'm talking to a room full of software people. It's like we already knew. We can't eliminate uncertainty. Okay, we can surface it early, and by using these controls and using these approaches, it means that we can get a much better handle on what it is we're trying to do. So we just need to shift our governance to follow the iterative world that we're moving into. Thank you.